Chapter 104. With Chicken George gone, his luck gone, and perhaps his nerve gone as well, the fortunes of Massalia continued to decline. At first he ordered little George into full-time daily care of the chickens, but toward the end of only a third day, the Massa found some of the cockerel pen's water pans empty, and the chubby, slow little George was sent fleeing with dire threats. The youngest boy, Louis, 19, was next transferred from field work to take on the job. In preparation for the season's several remaining game-cocking matches, Massalia now was forced to take over most of the pre-fight training and conditioning chores himself, since Louis as yet simply did not know how. He accompanied the Massa to the various local contests, and each of those days the rest of the family gathering in the evenings awaited the return of Louis to tell them whatever had happened. The Massa's birds had lost more fights than they won, Lewis always said, and after a while that he had overheard men openly talking that Tom Leah was trying to borrow money to make bets. Ain't many seem like they wants to talk with Massa. They just speaks or waves quick and keeps going like he got the plague. Yeah, the plague of them knowing now he po, said Matilda. Po all he ever been, Sister Sarah snapped. It became Slave Rose common knowledge that Massa Leah had taken to drinking heavily, almost every day, between his shouting matches with Mrs. Leah. That old man ain't never been dis evil, Miss Melizzy told her grimly listening audience one night. He hit the house actin' just like a snake, hollerin' and cussin' if and Missy even look at him. And all day long when he gone, she in there cryin', she don't even never want to hear no more about no chickens. Matilda listened, emotionally drained from her own weeping and praying since her chicken George had been gone. Briefly, her glances reviewed their teenaged daughters and six strong grown sons, three of them now with mates and children. Then her eyes came back to rest upon her blacksmith son, Tom, as if she wished he would say something. But who spoke instead was Lily Sue, Virgil's pregnant mate, who was briefly visiting from the nearby curry plantation where she lived and fear was thick in her tone. I don't know y'all's mass as good as you do, but I just feels he gonna do something terrible. Shows we born. A silence fell among them, no one being willing to express their own guess, at least not aloud. After the next morning's breakfast, Miss Melizzy waddled hurriedly from the kitchen down to the blacksmith shop. Massa say tell you saddle his hoss and get it round to the front porch, Tom, she urged her large eyes visibly moist. Laud, please hurry up, cause the things he's been saying to Paul misses just ain't hardly fitting. Without a word, Tom soon tied the saddled horse to a gate post. And he had just started back around the side of the big house when Massalia came lurching through the front door, already red-faced from drinking. He struggled up onto the horse's back and galloped away, weaving in the saddle. Through a half-opened window, Tom could overhear Mrs. Leah weeping as if her heart would break. Feeling embarrassment for her, he continued across the backyard to the blacksmith shed where he was just starting to beat a dulled plow point into sharpness when Miss Melizzy came again. Tom, she said, I Claire seem like Massa just wind up killing hisself. He keep on like he going, man nigh on to eighty years old. You want to know the truth, Miss Melizzy, he replied. I believe one way or another that's what he trying to do. Massalia returned during the mid-afternoon, accompanied by another white man on horseback, and from their respective kitchen and blacksmith shop observation posts, both Miss Melizzy and Tom saw with surprise that the pair didn't dismount and enter the big house to freshen up and share a drink, as was always previously done with any guests. Instead, the horses were kept trotting on down the back road toward the gamecock area. Not half an hour later, Tom and Miss Melizzy saw the visitor come back riding rapidly alone holding under one arm a frightened, clucking game hen, and Tom being outside was able to catch a fairly close glimpse of the man's furious expression as he rode by. It was at that night's usual slave row gathering when Lewis told what actually had happened. When I heard the hosses coming, he said, I just made show massa seed me work and foe I made myself scarce, over behind some bushes where I knowed I could see and hear. Well, after some pretty hot bargaining, they come to a hundred dollar agreement for this game hen settin' on a clutch o' eggs, and I seen the man count out the money, then Massa counted again for puttin' it in his pocket. 
Right after then, a misunderstanding commenced about the man saying the eggs under the hen went with the deal. Well, Master commenced to cussin' like he crazy. He run, grab up the hen, and with his foot stomped and squashed that nest o' eggs into one mess. Them two was nigh fightin' when all of a sudden, the otter man scratched the hen and jumped on his hoss, yellin' he'd bust Massa's head if he wasn't so damn old. The uneasiness of the slave row family deepened with each passing day and nights were spent in fitful sleep resultant from worry of whatever might be the next frightful development. Across that 1855 summer and into the fall, with every angry outburst from the Massa, with his every departure or arrival, the rest of the family's eyes involuntarily would turn to the 22-year-old blacksmith Tom, as if appealing for his direction. But Tom offered none. By the crisp November, when there had been a fine harvest from the masses roughly 65 acres in cotton and tobacco, which they knew he had been able to sell for a good price, one Saturday dusk Matilda watched from her cabin window until she saw Tom's last blacksmithing customer leave, and she hurried out there, her expression telling him from long experience that something special was on her mind. "'Yes, a mammy?' he asked, starting to bank the fire in his forge. I've been thinking, Tom, all six you boys done growed up to be men's now. You ain't my oldest, but I's your mammy, and knows you's got the levelest head, Matilda said. Plus that, you's the blacksmith, and they's feel hands. So look like you's got to be the man now of this family, since your daddy gone about eight months now. Matilda hesitated, then added loyally, least ways till he get back. Tom was frankly startled, for ever since his boyhood, he had been his family's most reserved member. Although he and his brothers had all been born and reared on Massalia's plantation, he had never become very close with any of them, principally because he had been away for years as a blacksmithing apprentice, and since his return as a man, he was at the blacksmith's shed, while the rest of his brothers were out in the fields. He had especially little contact any more with Virgil, Ashford, and Little George for differing reasons. Virgil, now 26, spent all his free time over on the adjoining plantation with his wife Lily Sue and their recently born son, whom they had named Uriah. As for Ashford, 25, he and Tom had always disliked and avoided each other, and Ashford had become more bitter at the world than ever since a girl he desperately wanted to marry had a massa who refused to let them jump the broom, calling Ashford an uppity <laughs> And the 24-year-old little George, now just plain fat, was also deep in courtship with an adjoining plantation's cook, twice his age, which evoked wry family comments that he would woo anyone who would fill his stomach. Matilda's telling Tom that she saw him as the family leader startled him the more since it implied his becoming their intermediary with Massalia, with whom he intentionally had very little actual contact. From when the equipment had been bought to establish a blacksmith shop, the Massa somehow had always seemed to respect Tom's quiet reserve, along with his obvious competence at blacksmithing, which brought in an increasing flow of customers. They always paid the Massa at the big house for whatever jobs Tom had done, and each Sunday the Massa gave Tom two dollars for his week's work. Along with Tom's ingrained reticence to talk very much with anyone was his equal tendency to ponder deeply on private thoughts. No one ever would have dreamed that for two years or more he had turned over and over again in his mind his father's descriptions of exciting potentials that Up North offered to free black people, and Tom had weighed at great length proposing to the whole Slave Row family that instead of waiting more endless years trying to buy their freedom, they should carefully plan and attempt a mass escape to the North. He had reluctantly abandoned the idea in realization that Grandmammy Kizzy must be well into her sixties, and old sister Sarah and Miss Malizzi, who seemed the same as family, were in their seventies. He felt that those three would have been the quickest to leave, but he seriously doubted if any of them would survive the risks and rigors of such a desperate gamble. More recently, Tom had privately deduced that the Mass's recent cockfight loss must have been even greater than he had fully revealed. Tom had closely watched Massalia becoming more strained, haggard, and aged with each passing day and each emptied bottle of whiskey. But Tom knew that the most disturbing evidence of something deeply amiss was that by now, Lewis declared, the Massa had sold off at least half of his chickens, whose bloodlines represented at least half a century of careful breeding. 
Then Christmas came, and ushered in the new year of 1856, as a heavy pall seemed to hang over not only the slave row, but also the entire plantation. Then in early spring afternoon, another rider came up the entry lane. At first, Miss Malizia praised him as another chicken buyer, but then, seeing how differently the massa greeted this one, she grew apprehensive. Smiling and chit-chatting with the man as he dismounted, the massa yelled to the nearby little George to feed water and stable the horse for the night. Then graciously, Massa Lee squired his visitor inside. Before Miss Malizzi even began serving the big house supper, outside in Slave Row, the family members were exchanging fearful questions. Who dat man, anyhow? Ain't never seen him before. Mass ain't acted like that no time recent. Well, what you reckon him here for? They could hardly await the later arrival and report of Miss Malizzi. They ain't talked in my hear and nothing mount to nothing, she said. Could be cause old missus was right there. Then Miss Malizzi went on emphatically, but somehow or another, I just don't know how like that odder man's looks. Seed too many like him before, shifty eyed and trying to act like they something they ain't. A dozen pairs of slave row eyes were monitoring the big house windows from slave row when the obvious movements of a lamp told that Mrs. Leah had left the men in the living room and made her way upstairs to bed. The living room's lamp was still burning when the last of the slave row family gave up the vigil and went to bed, dreading the daybreak wake-up bell. Matilda took her blacksmith's son aside at her first chance, before breakfast. Tom, last night wasn't no chance to tell you private, and ain't wanted to scare everybody to death, but Malizzi told me she heard Massa say he got to pay two mortgage notes on day house, and Malizzi no day ain't hardly got a penny. I just feels to my feet that white man's a <laughs> buyer. Me too, Tom said simply. He was silent for a moment. Mammy, I have been thinking, with some different Massa we just might find ourselves better off. That is, long's we all stays together, that's my big worry. As others began to come out of their cabins for the morning, Matilda hurried away rather than unduly alarm them by continuing the conversation. After Mrs. Leah told Miss Malizzi that she had a headache and wanted no breakfast, the massa and his visitor ate a hearty one and then set out walking in the front yard, busily talking, their heads close together. Before very long, they sauntered alongside the big house, into the backyard, and finally over to where Tom was pumping his homemade bellows, sending yellowish sparks flying up from his forge in which two flat wheels of iron were approaching the heating necessary for their conversion into door hinges. For several minutes, the two men stood closely watching Tom use long-handled tongs to remove the cherry-red iron sheets deftly folding their middles tightly about a shaving rod fixed into the hardy hole of his Fisher and Norris anvil, forming the channel for hinge pins. He then steel-punched three screw holes into each leaf, taking up his short-shanked cold chisel and his favorite homemade four-pound hammer. He cut the leaves into the H-shaped hinges that a customer had ordered, working all the while as if unaware of his observer's presence. Massalia finally spoke. He's a pretty fair blacksmith, if I do say so myself, he said casually. The other man grunted affirmatively. Then he began moving around under the little blacksmithing shed, eyeing the many examples of Tom's craftsmanship that hung from nails and pegs. Abruptly, the man addressed Tom directly. How old are you, boy? Going on twenty-three now, sir. How many young'uns you got? Ain't got no wife yet, sir. Big, strong boy like you don't need no wife to have young'uns scattered everywhere. Tom said nothing, thinking how many white men's youngins were scattered in slave rows. Maybe one of these real religious... <laughs> Tom knew the man was trying to draw him out for a reason, almost certainly to size him up for purchase. He said pointedly, I imagine's Massalia then told you we's mostly a family here, my mammy, grandmammy, and brothers and sisters and youngins. We's all been raised to believe in the Lord and the Bible, sir. The man's eyes narrowed. Which one of y'all reads the Bible to the rest? Tom wasn't about to tell this ominous stranger that both his grandmammy and mammy could read. He said, Reckon we all just growed up here in the scriptures so much we knows em by heart, sir. Seeming to relax, the man returned to his original subject. You think you could handle the blacksmithing on a much bigger place than this one? 
Tom felt ready to explode with the further confirmation that his sale was planned, but he had to know if the family was also to be included. Through his rage to be dangled in suspense like this, again he probed, Well, sir, me and Daressa's here can raise crops and do pre near everything a place need, I guess. Leaving the seething Tom as calmly as they had come, the Massa and his guest had no more than headed toward the fields when old Miss Melizzy came hurrying from the kitchen. What dem men sayin', Tom? Mrs. can't even look me in the eye. Trying to control his voice, Tom said, It's going to be some sellin', Miss Melizzy. Maybe all us, but could just be me. Miss Melizzy burst into tears, and Tom roughly shook her shoulders. Miss Melizzy, ain't no need o' cryin'. Just like I told Mammy, I spec some new place see us better off than here with him. But try as Tom would, he couldn't ease the aged Miss Melizzy's grief. Late that day, the rest of them returned from the fields. Tom's brothers wearing grim, stricken faces amid the women's copious weeping and wailing. All of them were trying at once to tell how the Massa and his visitor also had come out watching them as they worked, with the stranger then moving from one to another asking questions that left no doubt that they were being appraised for sale. Until into the wee hours, there was no way that the three people within the big house could have missed hearing the rising pandemonium of grief and terror that arose among the seventeen people in the slave row most of the men eventually reacting as hysterically as the women as they all became seized in the contagion of grabbing and hugging whomever was nearest, screaming that they would soon never see each other again. Law, deliver us from this evil, shrieked Matilda in prayer. Tom rang the next morning's wake-up bell with a prescience of doom. Aged Miss Melizzy had passed by him, making her way to the big house kitchen to prepare breakfast. Not ten minutes later, she heavily returned to Slave Row, her black face taut with fresh shock and glistening with fresh tears. Massa say don't nobody go nowhere. He say when he finish breakfast, he want everybody assembled out here. Even sick, ancient Uncle Pompey was brought from his cabin in his chair as all of them assembled, terrified. When Massalia and his visitor came around the side of the big house, Massalia's lurching walk told seventeen pairs of eyes that he had been drinking even more heavily than usual, and when the pair of them stopped about four yards before the slave row people, the Massa's voice was loud, angry, and slurred. Y'all, keep your noses always stuck in my business, so ain't no news to you this place going broke. Y'all too much burden for me to carry no more, so I'm doing some selling to this gentleman here. At the chorus of shrieks and groans, the other man gestured roughly. Shut up! All this carrying on since last night. He glared up and down the line until they quieted down. I ain't no ordinary <laughs> traitor. I represent one of the biggest, finest firms in the business. We got branch offices and boats delivering to order between Richmond, Charleston, Memphis, and New Orleans. Matilda cried out the first anguish in all their minds. We gonna get sold together, Massa? I told you shut up. You'll find out. I ought not to have to say to your Massa here's a true gentleman, same as that fine lady up in that house crying her heart out about your black hides. They could get more to sell y'all a piece. Plenty more. He glanced at the quaking little Kizzy and Mary. You two wenches ready right now to start breeding <laughs> Worth four hundred and up apiece. His glance fell on Matilda. Even if you gettin' pretty old. You said you know how to cook. Down south a good cook'll bring twelve to fifteen hundred nowadays. He looked at Tom. The way price is up now, reckon a prime stud blacksmith can easy fetch twenty five hundred, much as three thousand from somebody wants you to take in customers like you do in here. His eyes scanned across Tom's five brothers between twenty and twenty-eight years of age. And y'all field hand bucks ought to be worth nine hundred to a thousand apiece. The slave trader paused for effect. But y'all one lucky bunch of... <coughs> your missus insists y'all got to be sold together, and your masses going along with that. Thank you, missus. Thank you, Jesus, Grandmammy Kizzy cried out. Praise God, shrieked Matilda. Shut up, the slave trader angrily gestured. 
I've done my best to convince them different, but I ain't been able. And it just happened my firm's got some customers with a tobacco plantation ain't too far from here. Right near the North Carolina Railroad Company over in Alamance County. They're wanting a family of that's been together and won't give no trouble, no runaways or nothing like that, and with experience to handle everything on their place. Won't need no auctioning you off. I'm told won't need no chaining you up, nothing like that, less than I have some trouble. He surveyed them coldly. All right, starting right now, y'all I've spoke to consider yourselves my <laughs> till I get you where you're going. I'm giving you four days to put your stuff together. Saturday morning, we'll get you moving over to Alamance County in some wagons. Virgil was the first to find a stricken voice. What about my Lily Sue and child over at the Curry Place? You gonna buy them too, ain't you, sir? Tom burst out. And what about their grandmammy, Sister Sarah, Miss Melizzi, and Uncle Pompey? They's family you ain't mentioned. Ain't meant to. Can't be buying every wench some bucks laid with. So he won't feel lonely. The slave trader exclaimed sarcastically. As for these old wrecks here, they can hardly walk, let alone work. No customer is going to buy them. But Mr. Lee is being good enough to let him keep dragging on around here. Amid an outburst of exclamations and weeping, Grandmammy Kizzy sprang squarely before Massalia, words ripping from her throat. You done sent off your own boy. Can't I least have grandchillins? As Massalia quickly looked away, she slumped toward the ground, young, strong arms grabbing and supporting her, while old Miss Melizzi and Sister Sarah screamed almost as one. Days all the family I got, Massa. Me too, Massa. We's fifty-some years together. The invalid, ancient Uncle Pompey just sat, unable to rise from his chair, tears streaming down his cheeks, staring blankly straight ahead, his lips moving as in prayer. Shut up, the slave trader yelled. I'm telling you the last time. You find out quick I know how to handle... Tom's eyes sought and locked for a fleeting instant with those of Massalia, and Tom hoarsely fully chose words. Massa, we show sorry you's met bad luck, and we know's only reason you sellin' us is you got to. Massalia seemed almost grateful before his eyes again bent downward, and they had to strain to hear him. Nah, I ain't got nothing against none of y'all, boy, he hesitated. Fact, I'd even call y'all good... Most of y'all born and bred up right on my place. Massa, gently Tom begged, if them Alamance County peoples won't take our family's old folks, ain't it some way you let me buy em from you? This man done just say they ain't worth much in money, and I pay you good price. I get on my knees and beg the new Massa let me find some hire out blacksmithin', maybe for that railroad, and my brothers hire out and help too, sir. Tom was abjectly pleading, tears now starting down his cheeks. Massa, all we makes, we sends you till we pays whatever you ax for. Grandmammy and these three mo, that's family to us. Always been through together, we shall appreciate staying together, Massa. Massalia had stiffened, but he said, All right, get me three hundred dollars apiece, you can have them. His palm shot up before their exultation could fully erupt. Hold on, they stay here till the money's in my hand. Amid the groans and sobs, Tom's voice came, bleak. Us kind of spected Mo and Dat from you, Massa, sitter and everything. Get him out of here, traitor, the Massa snapped. Turning on his heel, he walked rapidly toward the big house. Back in the desperately despairing slave row. Even old Miss Melizzi and Sister Sarah were among those comforting Grandmammy Kizzy. She sat in her rocking chair that Tom had made for her, amid the welter of her family hugging, kissing her, wetting her with their tears. Everyone was crying. From somewhere she found the strength, the courage to rasp hoarsely. Don't y'all take on so. Me and Sarah, Melizzi and Pompey just wait here for George till he gets back. Ain't gonna be that long. It's already going on to two years, 
If and he ain't got the money to buy us, then I speck won't take much more time for Tom and Ressy all boys will. Ashford gulped. Yes, em, we show sure will. Wanly, she smiled at him, at them all. Another thing, Grandmammy Kizzy went on. Any y'all gets mo chillins fo I sees you again, don't forget to tell him about my folks, my Mammy Belle, and my African pappy named Kunta Kinti. What be yo chillin's great great grandpappy? Hear me now. Tell him bout me, bout my George, bout yourselves too, and bout what we been through midst different masses. Tell the chillins all the rest bout who we is. Amid a snuffling chorus of we show sure will, ain't go never forget, grandmammy. She brushed the nearest faces with her hand. Shush now, everything gonna be fine. Hush up, done told you. Y'all gonna flood me right out the door. Four days somehow passed, with those who were leaving getting packed, and finally Saturday morning came. Everyone had been up through most of the night. With scarcely a word uttered, they gathered holding each other's hands, watching the sun come up. Finally, the wagons arrived. One by one, those who were leaving turned silently to embrace those who were to remain behind. Where's Uncle Pompey? asked someone. Miss Melizzi said, poor old soul told me last night he couldn't stand to see y'all go. I run kiss him anyhow, exclaimed little Kizzy, and went running toward the cabin. In a little while, they heard her. Oh, no! Others already on the ground, or leaping from the wagon, went dashing. The old man sat there in his chair, and he was dead. Chapter 105 On the new plantation, it wasn't until the next Sunday, when Massa and Mrs. Murray drove off in their buggy to attend church services, that the whole family had a chance to sit down together for a talk. Well, I sure ain't want to judge too quick, said Matilda, looking around at all of her brood. But all through the week, me and Mrs. Murray done plenty talking in the kitchen whilst I been cooking. I gotta say, she and this new massa sounds like good Christian peoples. I feel like we's gonna be a whole lot better off here, except your pappy still ain't back, and grandmammy and them still at Massa Leah's. Again studying her children's faces, she asked, Well, from what y'all seed and heard, how y'all feel? Virgil spoke. Well, this massa Murray don't seem like he know much about farming, or being no massa neither. Matilda interrupted. That's cause they was town folks running a stow in Burlington, till his uncle died, and in his will left him this place. Virgil said, Every time he done talked to me, he said he looking for a white overseer to hire to work us. I done kept telling him, Ain't no need to spend that money. That worse than a overseer, he needed at least five, six more field hands. Told him just give us chance. We raise him good tobacco crops by ourselves. Ashford broke in. I ain't staying long nowhere with no cracker overseer tracking every move. After a pointed look at Ashford, Virgil went on. Massa Murray say he watch a while and see how we do. He paused. I just but begged him to buy my Lily Sue and youngin for Massa Curry back yonder and bring him here. Told him Lily Sue work as hard as anybody he ever gon' get. He said he'd think about it, but to buy us, they already done had to take out a bank mortgage on the big house, and he see how much backy he sell this year. Virgil paused. So we all gotta pitch in. I can tell other white folks been given him plenty advising. <laughs> Won't half work by they selves. Let him see any hanging back and playing round. We show liable wind up with some overseer. Glancing again at the sullen Ashford, Virgil added, Fack, I spec it be good when Massa Murray ride out where we's working low holler at y'all some, but y'all know why. Show, burst out Ashford. You and anybody else I know is always tries to be Mass's special. <laughs> Tom tensed, but managed to seem as if he totally ignored Ashford's remark while Virgil half rose, lancing forward a work calloused forefinger. Boy, let me tell you, something wrong anybody don't get long with nobody. Gonna get you in big trouble one these days, just speaking for myself. If in it bees with me, somebody gonna carry off one of us. Hush! Both y'all hush up that mess, Matilda glared at them both, then particularly at Ashford, before turning an entreating look onto Tom, clearly seeking an easing of the sudden tension. Tom, whole lot of times I see you and Massa Murray talking down there while you putting up yo shop. What's yo feelings? 
Slowly, thoughtfully, Tom said, I agree we ought to be better off here, but pend a lot on how we handles it. Like you said, Massa Marie don't peer no mean, low-down white man. I feel like Virgil say he just ain't had much experience to put no trust in us. Even mowing dat, I believe he worried we get to figure in he's easy. That's how come he make himself act and sound harder than he naturally is. And that's how come to overseer talk. Tom paused. Way I sees it. Mammy handled the missus. Ressus needs to teach the massa he do fine just leave us alone. After murmurs of approval, Matilda's tone was vibrant with her joy at clearly a potentially promising family future. Well, now, lining it up, long with what y'all says, we's got to swade Massa Murray to buy Lily Sue and that Lil Uriah, too. Bout y'all's pappy, ain't nothing we can do but just wait. He walk in here one these days. Giggling, Mary interrupted, with that green scarf trailing and black derby setting upon his head. Show right about that, daughter. Matilda smiled with the others. She went on. And cause I ain't even got to say about getting Grandmammy Sarah and Melizzy, I already got Mrs. Murray promised to help with that. Scribe to her as strong as I could how it just about tore us all up to have to leave em. Laud, Mrs. got to crying as hard as I was. She say weren't no use nobody including her axin Massa Murray to buy no three real old women's. But she promised faithful she asked Massa to get Tom hire out jobs, and the rest y'all boys too. So let's all keep in mind we ain't just here working for another Massa, we's working to get our family back together. With that resolve, the family settled into the planting season of 1856, with Matilda commanding the increasing trust and appreciation of both Mrs. and Massa Murray through her clear loyalty and sincerity, her excellent cooking, and her spotless housekeeping. The Massa saw how Virgil steadily urged and pressed his brothers and sisters toward a bumper tobacco crop. He saw Tom visibly putting the plantation into an enviable state of repair, his talented hands wielding his mostly homemade tools, transforming foraged old rusted discarded scrap iron into eventually scores of sturdy new farming tools and implements, along with both functional and decorative household items. Nearly every Sunday afternoon, unless the Murrays had gone off somewhere themselves, various of the local plantation families would pay them welcoming visits, along with their old friends from Burlington, Graham, Haw River, Mabon, and other towns around. In showing their guests about the big house and yards, the Murrays always proudly pointed out different examples of Tom's craftsmanship. Few of their farm or township guests left without urging that the Massa permit Tom to make a repair something for them, and Massa Murray would agree. Gradually, more of Tom's custom-made articles appeared about Alamance County, as word of mouth further advertised him, and Mrs. Murray's original request that the Massa seek hire-out jobs for Tom became entirely unnecessary. Soon, every day saw slave men, young and old, come riding on mules, or sometimes afoot, bringing broken tools or other items for Tom to fix. Some masses or misses sketched decorative items they wanted made for their homes, or sometimes customers' requests require that Massa Murray write out a traveling pass for Tom to ride a mule to other plantations, or into local towns, to make on-site repairs or installations. By 1857, Tom was working from dawn to dark every day excepting Sundays, his overall volume of work at least equaling that of Mr. Isaiah, who had taught him. The customers would pay Massa Murray either at the big house or when they saw him at church, such rates as 14 cents a hoof for the shoeing of horses, mules, or oxen, 37 cents for a new wagon tire, 18 cents to mend a pitchfork, or 6 cents to sharpen a pick. Prices for customer-designed decorative work were specially negotiated, such as $5 for a trellis-shaped front gate adorned with oak leaves, and each weekend Massa Murray figured out for Tom's pay 10 cents of each dollar that his work had brought in during the previous week. After thanking the Massa, Tom gave the weekly sum to his mother, Matilda, who soon had it buried in one of her glass jars whose locations only she and Tom knew. On Saturday noons, the work week ended for the family's field hands. Lil Kizzy and Mary, now 19 and 17 respectively, quickly bathed, wrapped their short kinky braids tightly with string, and rubbed their faces to shiny blackness with beeswax. 
Then, donning their best, starchily ironed cotton print dresses, they soon appeared at the blacksmith shop, one bringing a pitcher of water or sometimes lemon egg, with the other carrying a gourd dipper. Once Tom had quenched his thirst, they next offered welcomed gourdfuls among each Saturday afternoon's invariable small gathering of slave men whose masses had sent them to pick up items that Tom had promised to complete by the weekend. Tom noted, with wry amusement, how his sister's lightest, gayest banter was always with the better-looking younger man. One Saturday night, he was not surprised to overhear Matilda shrilly voicing chastisement. I ain't blind. Sees y'all down there flouncing your tails amongst them men's. Lil Kizzy came back defiantly. Well, mammy, we's women's. Ain't met no men's at Massa Leah's. Matilda loudly muttered something that Tom couldn't distinguish, but he suspected that she was privately less disapproving than she was trying to act. It was confirmed when, shortly after, Matilda said to him, "'Look like you letting them two gals go to court and right under your nose. Reckon the least you can do is keep out a eye it ain't the wrong ones they hooks up with.'" To the entire family's astonishment, not the particularly flouncy little Kizzy, but the much quieter Mary soon quietly announced her wish to jump the broom with a stable hand from a plantation near the village of Mubbin. She pleaded to Matilda, I know as you can help swade Massa to sell me reasonable when Nicodemus's Massa acts about it, mammy, so us can live together, but Matilda only muttered vaguely, sending Mary into tears. Laud, Tom, I just don't know how to feel, Matilda said. Cause I's happy for the gal. I see she's so happy, but just hates to see any of us soul off no more. You's wrong, Mammy. You knows you is, Tom said. I show sure wouldn't want to be married with nobody living somewhere else. Look what happened to Virgil. Ever since we got soul, you can see he's sick about Lily Sue left back yonder. Son, she said, don't tell me about being married to somebody you don't never hardly see. Whole lot of times, looking at y'all chillins, hep me know I got a husband. Matilda hesitated, but getting back to Mary leaving, ain't just her on my mind, it's all y'all. You workin' so much, guess you ain't paid no tension. But on Sundays off nowadays, don't hardly never see your brothers round here no more. Just you and Virgil. The rest all off, coatin' heavy. Mammy, Tom sharply interrupted, we's grown men's. Show you is, retorted Matilda. Ain't what I'm getting at. I's mean and it look like this family gonna split to the winds for we ever gets it back together. In a silent moment between them, Tom was trying to think of what comforting thing he might say, sensing that underlying his mother's recent quick irritability or unaccustomed depressions were the months now passed beyond when his father should have returned. As she had just mentioned, she was again living with his absence. Tom was shocked when abruptly Matilda glanced at him. When are you gonna get married? Ain't thinking about that now. Embarrassed, he hesitated and changed the subject. Thinking about us getting back grandmammy, Sister Sarah and Miss Melizzy. Mammy, about how much we got saved up now. No, bout, tell you exactly. That two dollars and four cents you give me last Sunday make it eighty-seven dollars and fifty-two cents. Tom shook his head. I's got to do better. Show wish Virgil and them was helping Ma. Can't blame them. Hire out field work, just hard to find. Cause most masses need and it hires free <laughs> what works fit to kill themselves to get that twenty five cents a day lesson day starves. I just got to make Ma. Grandmammy, Sister Sarah and Miss Melizzy. They's all getting old. Yo grandmammy right round seventy now. And Sarah and Melizzy nigh about eighty. A sudden thought struck Matilda. Her features took on a faraway expression. Tom, you know what just come to me? Yo grandmammy used to say her African pappy kept up with how old he was by dropping little rocks in a gourd. You remember her saying that? Yes, I'm sure does, he paused. Wonder how old was he? Ain't never heard, least not to my recollection. A puzzlement grew on her face. Would pend when was you talking about? He'd have been one age when Grandmammy Kizzy was sold from him and her mammy. Then he'd have been another age whenever the Lord claimed him. She hesitated. Would Grandmammy push in seventy? You know her pappy got to be long dead and gone. Her mammy, too. Po souls. Yeah, said Tom, musing. Sometime I wonders what they look like. Done heard so much about em. Matilda said, Me too, son. 
She straightened in her chair. But getting back to your grandmammy, Sarah and Melizzy, every night down on my knees, I just ask the Lord to be with him, and I praise any day your pappy get here with lump of money in his pocket and buy him. She laughed brightly. One mon and we looks up and dare all foe be, free as birds. That be show one sight to see, grinned Tom. A silence fell between them, each in their private thoughts. Tom was pondering that now was as good a time and atmosphere as any to confide in his mother something he had kept carefully guarded from anyone, but which now did seem likely to develop further. He used as his avenue an earlier query of Matilda's. Mammy, while back you ax if and I ever think maybe about getting married. Matilda jerked upright, her face and eyes alight. Yes, yeah, son? Tom could have kicked himself for ever having brought it up. He all but squirmed, seeking how to go on. Then, firmly, well, I's kind of met a gal, and we've been talking some. Lord o' mussy, Tom. Who? Ain't nobody you knows. Her name, Irene. Some calls her Reeny. She belongs to that massa Edwin Holt, workin' day big house. The rich massa Holt massa and missus talks bout own dat cotton mill on Alamance Creek? Yassum. They big house where you put up them pretty window grills? Yassum. Tom's expression was rather like that of a small boy caught taking cookies. Lord, a beaming spread across Matilda's face. Somebody caught at last. Springing up, suddenly embracing her embarrassed son, she burbled, I so happy for y'all. Tom show sure is. Hold on, hold on, Mammy, extricating himself. He gestured her back toward her chair. I just say we've been talking. Boy, use my close mouthedest youngin' since you first drawed breath. If you mits use much as seed a gal, I know it mo to it than that. He all but glared at her. Don't want no whisperin' to nobody, you hear me? I know, Massa Buyer, fo you, boy. Tell me mo better, Tom. So much was tumbling in Matilda's head that it poured out together. Across the back of her mind flashed a vision of the wedding cakes she would bake. Getting late, gotta go. But she beat him to the door. So glad somebody be catching all y'all youngins for long. Use just my best. Matilda's laughter was the happiest Tom had seen her in a long time. Getting older, guess I same as Grandmammy Kizzy, wantin' mo grandchillins. Tom brushed past, hearing her as he strode outside. I live long enough, might even see some great-grandchillins.